Good morning, everyone. Uh, got a couple more people coming in, but thank you so much for joining us here today uh, for the Tony McMichael uh, Award announcement uh, and lecture. We have our first lecturee, Zoe Levinson, who will be stepping up shortly. Uh, but before we begin, I certainly would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land, to the Nenawal and Native people, their elders, past and present, and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the audience today. Um, I'm so pleased to be emceeing this event. Um, this personal event is funded by Philanthropy, so the McMichael Award started last year. We have our inaugural awardee, Dr. Zoe Levinson, who's going to talk to us a little bit about her research. And I think it ties in very well with what we're seeing in the room today, because it talks about how when we all come together, we have a little bit more of an understanding of what we all feel about this and how that can be impactful for the great changes we're going to need to make in the world as a collective audience, as a collective people, if we really want to move the needle on this. So to really give you a good understanding of the award, I'm going to invite Professor Hilary Mambrick, head of NSEF, up to talk about NSEF and Tony McMichael. Thank you, Eric. Yuma, hello and welcome. Um, I'd like to open today's event by gratefully acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today, the Ngunnawal and Manri people, and to acknowledge that these lands have always been places of storytelling, knowledge sharing, and caring for country. I pay Yindumara my respects to elders past and present, to custodians who've taken care of country for many, many thousands of years. And I also pay my respects to all First Nations people joining today. The National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health at the ANU is delighted to host the first ever um, annual McMichael Lecture in memory of the life and work of the late Professor Tony McMichael AO. Tony was Director of NSEF for a number of years in the 2000s. Throughout his career, Tony McMichael was a champion of environmental health, and in particular, he was the world's authority on the health impacts of climate change. He advised the World Health Organization and the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and in 2007, he was co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize for his work with the IPCC. No pressure, Zoe. <laughs> Tony was also instrumental in alerting the world to the dangers of passive smoking, as well as the health impacts of lead pollution. So his work led to the ban on leaded petrol uh, in more than 100 countries. And only just a couple of years ago, the United Nations Environment Program announced that leaded petrol was no longer being sold anywhere in the world. So this is another of Tony's life-saving legacies. The climate crisis is complex and ongoing and requires a bringing together of disciplines and people. As Tony understood, it requires not only knowledge of the environment's impact on us, but also of our impact on the environment and our responsibility to limit this impact and protect our ultimate life support system. We owe a special thank you to Associate Professor Judith Healy, Tony's partner in life, academic and the driving force behind this award. Thank you, Judith. Today I'm introducing Dr. Zoe Levston, our inaugural McMichael Award winner for 2022, who will deliver today's lecture. Zoe has a PhD in psychology from Curtin University. Before commencing at ANU in 2020, Zoe was a research scientist at CSIRO and a postdoc research fellow at Edith Cowan. Zoe applies social psychological theory to investigate how individuals, groups, and culture shape people's responses to climate change and other environmental issues. She's especially interested in how group responses and social norms influence people's attitudes and behaviors and the role of collective action in mainstreaming meaningful climate action. Thank you all for being with us here today on this momentous occasion celebrating and supporting research and impact in climate change and health. 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zoe Laviston, our inaugural speaker, to the stage. Thanks for that, Hillary. No pressure. That's a great thing to say to, uh, to a perpetually nervous speaker. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best today. So uh, I'd like to start by thanking Associate Professor Judith Healy, funding partners and donors, and NSEP, uh, for the opportunities for receiving this award has given me. Um, also thanks to Associate Professor Aparna Lal uh, for her guidance and support uh, in her role as Director of the Award Program. So I'm going to spend the next several minutes, and I've only got a few minutes, although I can bang on for hours, so please come and accost me uh, afterwards, showing you just some snippets of my findings throughout the year, uh, some plans for the future, and conclude by encouraging anyone who can apply to apply for future hours. Can you all hear me okay? No. no. <laughs> if I hold this, I'm going to shake. <laughs> How about this? Is it better? How about this now? Is this better? Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, hopefully you got a few of those thank yous. You good? Here we go. So, okay, so overall the aim of my project is to establish what types of collective environmental action lead to what kinds of emotional and well-being outcomes under what circumstances. So as a sub-part of that overall aim, I want to better understand the mechanisms or the pathways through which engagement and collective action is good not just for the environment, but, but for us as the people who are engaging in that action. So there are several plausible pathways to explore, but I think that one less explored pathway is this end one here which is about the assumptions we make about what other people think and do in relation to the environment and climate change. So most of you might be familiar with the concept of social norms and research showing that our beliefs about others have a really strong influence on our own behaviour. What I'm looking at is how those social normative perceptions are also shaped by our behaviour. So how we interact with other people and how this in turn uh, might be consequential uh, for our well-being and eco-emotional functioning. So how can we establish this, if this pathway is indeed plausible? One way we can do this is to ask people. Pretty simple, often overlooked. Um, but here we have examples of comments when we ask people who are already engaged in collective action. How does it make you feel? And I've just raised some points from young people, and why I'm putting young people up there I'll get to in a minute. But if we look at the larger corpus of responses from these people, we can start to infer some processes that might be going on here. So engagement fosters good feelings via an increased sense that they're not the only ones that care. So they infer others care because they see other people taking action with them. So in psychological parlance, we might say that group participation is providing them with social normative information about what others are thinking and doing. Now, do we, is it, is it, how important is this social, is this just reaffirmation? We have a, you know, a barrage of information about what other people are thinking and doing in relation to climate change. And with social animals, we should have a pretty good grip on what the person next to us is thinking. Um, so are we good at it? No. No is the simple answer to that. Uh, so here's a recent data from a latest study where we asked people to rate their levels of concern about climate change. So you can give it a scale, don't care at all, to I'm extremely concerned. What we find here, of course, with what we know from, from pollen data, uh, that aggregate levels of concern across the community is high. So it's well above the midpoint, it's great. What happens if we ask the same people another question, how concerned are Australians about climate change? So essentially we're asking these people to, to, to guess how the other people in the survey um, rate of this. And this is what we get, and it replicates what myself and other people have found previously. It's a really robust finding. People systematically in underestimate other people's concern about climate change. We do the same thing about private pro-environmental behaviour, and we do the same thing where we underestimate other people's biospheric values as well. We nearly all do it. Uh, we like to think we don't because our biases suggest that I'm less biased than the person next to me, but we nearly all do it. 
And the amount that we underestimate by is relatively robust across individual differences and across demographics, even though intuitively you'd suspect not. With some key differences, one of those key differences is younger cohorts tend to underestimate other people's climate concern much more than the older cohorts. So this suggests that social normative information, uh, the cues that we get through that are important because it's actually, we're really pretty lousy at knowing what other people are thinking, so we need those cues. Uh, and underestimation is, is, is problematic because we know it's also associated with things like disempowerment, lack of optimism, etc. The good, you know, functional uh, eco-emotions, if you like, that we'd like to foster. Uh, I, please, someone ask me about this exciting graph in the Q and A, but I've realised I don't have time uh, to to present it. But it's just to show that optimism is moderated by higher levels of collective engagement. Um, so one last last slide of results, which is just a crude summary of the associations that, that, that we found in this research: greater collective engagement in a variety of things. So not just you know marching up and down a square protesting, but being part of different environmental groups. We find that this is associated with higher estimates of other people's concern, which in turn is related to a suite of things that we like to see. So it's related to higher levels of efficacy. So that's a sense that our actions are meaningful and will make a difference. Associated with lower climate powerlessness, higher climate optimism. It's associated with lower loneliness. This is really kind of interesting. I think the US Surgeon General recently said that that uh, loneliness is a, the, the new public health epidemic uh, and higher levels of well-being across a variety of issues. So great, um, we can say, concluded that that pathway is plausible, except that the one great caveat with this data is it's cross-sectional. So those, those arrows are doing a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, it is plausible, theoretically, and there's some empirical evidence to suggest that you can flip some of those arrow, arrows around. So that brings me to the next steps. First, we, we need more than one way of data to see how those associations change over time. What happens after six months, 12 months, 18 months? Does, does collective engagement drive normative perceptions of well-being or vice versa or both? So with time series data, we can start to have a very robust model of uh, the, the, the causal pathways and feedback loops associated with that. Uh, concurrent with that is experimental testing. So how can we leverage this information to foster great engagement, in the, the greater engagement in the first place? Because that's the big thing. So can we frame environment plus wellbeing co-benefits of acting to, to uh, incentivise uh, uptake and engagement? And lastly, this body of research, you know, it, I don't intend it to sit in a vacuum, uh, but for this information to feed into other research projects going on as well. So I'm involved in a uh, multi-year project that's just starting up with Telephone Kids Institute, Climate Justice Union, ECU and other people. And this is co-designed with young people. And so we're building strategies and tools to support young people's mental health and well-being in the context of the climate crisis. We know from our scoping work there that a chief reason for distress in young people is that they feel unvalidated by the rest of the community and that they feel that their concerns are not recognised. We also know that this is the cohort that tends to underestimate other people's environmental values and concern the most. And for valid reasons, I'm not suggesting that that's not valid. Um, but not to preempt the outcomes of that work because it is a proper co-design piece, but potentially participatory action that effectively shapes social normative possession, uh, perceptions has a potentially therapeutic role to play here. So, all, all that's by way of saying that this program of research essentially sets up a research program for the next couple of years. Like, last thing is a quick message to, to anyone thinking of applying for future rounds up out there that it is quite is unsure, just do it. Um, the application process is not arduous, it's not onerous. You may have had you know, bad experiences previously, this will not be one of them. Uh, why would you do that? Uh, let's talk about money. It's a non-trivial non -trivial amount of money. It's very generous. And that generosity means methodological approaches that open up to you, approaches that might not be available otherwise. So, for instance, I need well-powered representative and longitudinal data. For other people, it might be the ability to undertake this field work. Might also think about research assistance. 
So I, I'm lucky enough to bring, bring on board a research assistant for a couple of days for the last couple of months. Obviously amazing in terms of research productivity, but also think about it as an opportunity to bring HDR students on board into your projects that are working at the nexus of human health and the environment so we can widen the pipeline of scholars coming through. And finally, it's a great way of building networks, uh, collaborating with people outside your own college, outside your own school. Uh, you might find yourself getting invited to meetings with important people, which is terrifying, but um, <laughs> it's actually, it's actually uh, really good in uh, kind of getting a fuller understanding of how translational research uh, works in practice. So I really encourage you to apply and thank you once again. And I know for way too long, I'm so sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> we, maybe we could uh, devise some top-down strategies to, to, to force people in year 11 to, I don't know, plant trees with other people or something. Um, sorry. <laughs> And we'll have time for one more question, but just quickly pointing out, loving this, loving the engagement from the Crawford School. We've got psychology over here. This is what this was designed to do. This whole idea of how we need to bring together different disciplines, different knowledges to actually work together to solve a lot of these problems, I think is being seen in the questions asked and how we can sort of get that together. Uh, Hillary, I see you've got a question. Why don't you close this out? Thank you. Out? And uh, I'm not from the Crawford School. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, look, fantastic work. And it's, it's really wonderful to see how you've picked up with this award and run with it and come up with some absolutely fantastic um, outputs from it. So what's next for you? Uh, well, I, I, I guess it's about real worlding some of this. I mean, it's, it, it, it is, that's the hard part, right? Um, I, you know, happy, happily um, sit in my office with a closed door with massive data sets and just, you know, use all my, yeah, my statistical um, programs open and, and, and so on. But um, we don't really have the luxury of, of doing that as researchers these days. So it's, it's about using this to, to, um, to inform uh, partnered research. And I think, you know, I've been on projects where co-design has been used because we've sort of gone to a stakeholder and said, you know, do you have any questions about the results that we've found in the survey that we've done for you that asks you about your attitudes and things like that. So I think co-design is really important. So I mentioned that the, um, the project with um, children and young people, especially looking at uh, vulnerable communities as well, uh, and they are crying out for strategies and solutions right now which is kind of an, so it's about me getting out of that comfort zone to say, no, we need a, you know, we, yes, we do need a longitudinal quantitative evidence base because for some policymakers, that's what talks. But I think it's, the, the trick is now doing that concurrent with taking what we already know to roll out programs and strategies to, to help young people, especially, but all of us, uh, by extension, uh, deal with the, the multiple crises, climate-induced crises that we're going to have to deal with. Because young people have, actually have a really different perspective of what the research question should be, and that can be um, that can be quite liberating, I think, as a researcher too. So working in that space more, I think. Great, and we've got one final question to wrap everything up. Hi. Um, I'm Emily Banks. I'm also not from the Crawford School. Um, thank you so much, Zoe. That was really fantastic. And obviously, humanity has to have the solutions to the problems. So, the engagement, your, you know, the work you're doing is really important. I wondered if you had been able to dig a little bit deeper into what young people mean when they think about the concern, the level of concern in others. Because <clears throat> if you ask them, well, you know, uh, what proportion of the population would say they're concerned? Uh, compared to what proportion of the population would be willing to like give up their SUV or take material action. Um, so I just wondered if part of that imbalance was not just about the level of expressed concern, but actually a sense of hypocrisy about the older generation that kind of, you know, is part, I, I'm part of that, of getting us into this mess. But it's such, but, but, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, Absolutely right, which is why I kind of put that quick caveat in one of my last slides about not saying that that underestimation is not valid. Um, it's, because it's funny, if you look cross-sectionally, if you look at people's actual concern, I mean, one would presume that you, the younger cohorts are actually higher in, in actual concern. In fact, people's concern does not differ substantially across the demographics that you think it might. Um, uh, what, what differs is perceptions of other people. And it's, it's quite right that um, young people are saying, yeah, but is it a priority? You might you can be concerned about it, but is it a priority for you? It's clearly not. Um, and, you know, as a Gen X person, you can wave your hands about and say, look, I mean, it's terrible, it's, and I'm, I'm involved in all these groups, etc. But from, from a younger generation cohort, it's also, well, your generation is in charge. And if and you, you're um, if if you're not seeing signals, if you're not seeing structural signals of concern, then what I think is happening 
is those structural signals act as the social normative cue. And I think young people are attuned to those structural signals because they're you know, forecasting ahead, like this system is not sustainable, uh, more, so, more so than us that have had a longer time to be socialised in those you know, systems and structures. So I think it's a bit something faulty because they're, they're misinterpreting a norm. Um, I, I just think that the, the focal point is different from, from younger people because the stakes are higher. Wonderful. Thank you for the questions and thank you for the fantastic lecture. Can I give another round of applause? <laughs> so we are truly here at the beginning of the program. Um, as we noted, Zoe is the inaugural awardee uh, and we're looking to grow this cohort. And this will become an annual event. Uh, that we will certainly love to see your faces at again and again going forward because it is the networks, it's the growth of this program, it is the thought capital in this room that's going to continue to provide solutions. So now I am thrilled to invite up Associate Professor Aquana Lal, who is the Director of the Tony McMichael Awards and Fellowship Program at the National Center for Epidemiology and Population Health, to announce the incoming class. Um, we were very lucky this year to get a huge number of really high caliber applications and so with extra support I feel very lucky to announce that we have two of my award app um, applicants this year. Um, and our first one is Dr. Annabelle Dalhanty, who is a lecturer at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Her work focuses on gender and development and climate justice. The McMichael Award will allow Annabelle to determine best practices in how climate <coughs> adaptation policies and programs can best respond to the impact of climate change on women's food security, well-being and resilience to violence. Uh, and our second awardee is Dr. Amy Dole, who is a clinical psychologist who studies emotion regulation and well-being. The McMichael Award will support her to uncover the vital role that partners play in mother and child mental health following catastrophic climate events like the 2022 bushfires. So please join me in congratulating and welcoming the two McMichael Award winners. Well-deserved recognition, and we're excited to see you guys next year to come and present lectures as this program continues to grow. Um, everyone received a little flyer on the way in, and I know that many of you here are donors already to this program, but it is through the donations that we're able to continue to grow the program and that we're able to continue to fund the research taking place. So if you are so inclined in a spot to do so, there is a QR code on your flyer. Please feel free to make a gift. Gifts at all sizes are going to be very important to the continued growth of this program. Uh, and to close out our session today, uh, I'd love to invite up the Dean of the College of Health and Medicine, Russell Gruen, to give his thoughts on the program. Thank you, Eric, and thank you everybody for coming today. It's, a, it's wonderful to see you here in the audience. This university was founded in 1946 in a, a time of challenge, but with a spirit of post-war optimism. And the purpose of ANU, the cons constituted under federal legislation as the only Commonwealth University, was to help navigate the young Australia through this period of challenge by providing a postgraduate research-oriented university that would be true to its motto of first to understand the nature of things. Commitment to actually understanding the development of knowledge as the foundation of a safe, secure future for Australia and for the world. ANU's done that very, very well over the last 75 years. Some great examples have been the establishment by Bob Douglas, thank you for coming today, Bob, of the National Centre for Epidemiology and Population Health and its illustrious director, C. 
several years later, Professor Tony McMichael. Tony's name is known throughout the world as the founder and father of the science of health, environment and climate. It is now the biggest issue the planet faces. And I think we can all be very proud that a lot of that work started here at the ANU and it's been championed by a number of the people in this audience. And I think today we've seen the continuation of that work. Thank you, Zoe, very much for your efforts over the course of this year and for sharing some of that with us today. This fellowship, sponsored generously by Judith Healy, thank you, Judith, for your your dedication to, to Tony's legacy um, has enabled young people to be able to build on the legacy of Tony McMichael, to leverage his networks throughout the world of people also committed to a science-based future, and to make their own mark and build their own career. Really warmly welcome the two new fellows uh, to, to the scheme and have great hopes for what you might do and achieve over the next year. We really look forward to, to you presenting your work in, in 12 months' time. Congratulations to you both. And a, and a heartfelt thanks to a partner who has stewarded this through as a, the great convener and the, the really the mother of the fellows, aren't you? It's like your little nest, it's fantastic. <laughs> This has been very much your baby from the outset and, uh, and your leadership shines through the fellowship program. But it's not lost on any of us, the fact that this is a small program and a very big problem. And I think we need to grow this program in ways that can amplify across the world, that can connect people with Tony McMichael's network of, of influence around the world in new and different and, and very positive ways. Reinvigorating, again, that spirit of post-war optimism that, that was at the, the origin story of this university. It's just as relevant as it is today. And so I think through this program, we actually see the vision of what Amy needs to be doing now. Your one is being absolutely committed to a science-based future, where science decisions are based on, good, on knowledge, and on goodwill based on that knowledge. Secondly, on the preparation of leaders who will make a difference, people who can use that knowledge to influence the world. And then I think what I really heard from you though today was the importance of recognising what young people actually are facing today, young people and disadvantaged populations in particular, and giving them voice and what better role could there possibly be for a university than to embrace them, work with them, give them power, stoke the fire inside them and give them the tools to change the world. I'd love you to be part of this journey with us. Arik has uh, um, shown you a QR code and talked about coming and uh, if you feel like getting to the program, please do. But even more importantly, there's a world of influential and wealthy people who, who would love to support this. If you can connect us to them, it would be really, really helpful. Because we do want to grow this candle of a flame into a bonfire that is the McMichael Award going forwards. Thanks for coming. Um, I think there's an opportunity to mingle with the fellows and and with the school directors and the partner and, and Bob and Judith and everybody outside over drinks. Um, let's do it in the spirit of celebration of, of the first uh, the Tony McMichael Award is coming to the end of her fellowship and two new coming into the nest as part of a, a really important program for the world's future. Thank you.